Thank you, Sid. Uh, please, I welcome you. Please, let's hear your presentation. Thank you, Glenn. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I can, yes. Splendid. Uh, and, and thank you, too, especially to Children Now for giving me this opportunity, alongside such distinguished speakers, uh, to share my remarks at a time and on a topic that's so pivotal for the future of human beings. I confess, though, to feeling a little awkward. <clears throat> When you closely examine the damage that has been done to the earth by our present civilization, you find that far and away the greatest damage has been done in just the last 40 years. That pretty closely corresponds to my adult lifetime. When talking to young people, I feel a little like a bus driver who, having driven the bus right off the road and accelerated it towards a cliff, then turns to the passengers and says, here, take the wheel. Oh, and let me give you some advice. As it happens, I'm really just a passenger like you. In fact, this is alarming. We're all passengers and drivers too, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm here to talk about ecological consciousness. I don't actually like that term very much. When the name for an idea demands so many syllables, I can't help feeling something's amiss. This seems especially so when we're talking about an idea that was already perfectly familiar to people who lived successfully long before our own civilization was ever born or thought of. So I'm gonna come at this from the side, so to speak, rather than head on. I hope you'll bear with me. There's an ancient Latin proverb, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. Properly translated, this means as we pray, so shall we believe. And as we believe, so shall we live. Now, you may be a little worried about the word pray, so let's unpack that. It doesn't mean worship. Pray is an old English word that means ask or request, as in pray tell or pray pass the potatoes. So the proverb begins with what it is we ask of life, of the world, of the time we're given. The proverb then asserts that this will shape what we believe about life, the world, ourselves, and that our beliefs will, in turn, determine the way we set about to live, how we conduct our life. Or I should say, how we conduct our lives, because we don't do this alone. We're a social species, and our sense of ourselves only properly exists in relation to those about us. It is our shared narrative, our shared story about the world that gives shape and direction to our own lives, to our community, and to our civilization, <clears throat> excuse me, our civilization. The story about us that I grew up with will be perfectly familiar to you. As a child born in 1960, I was on the tip of a rocket, the rocket of progress. My grandfather was born the year the Wright brothers flew one of the first airplanes, and he lived to watch with his nine-year-old grandson as the first human steps on the moon were televised. He drove the first automobiles, I can ride in one that drives itself. The story of unending progress was confirmed wherever you looked. We went from cooking with wood to cooking with microwaves, from calculating with manual arithmetic to carrying a powerful computer in our pocket, from communicating by telegraph to, well, to this. Conquering was a word often used. We conquered disease, we conquered poverty, we conquered hunger, we even thought we could conquer war so to speak, that we could conquer conquering. Listen today, and you'll hear talk of conquering climate change. All of which was really a way of saying that we would conquer nature. And already before I was born, there were thoughtful people raising the alarm. For surely they said, we are part of nature too. There have been nearly a hundred distinct civilizations in known human history, and when we look at those that lasted longest, the contrast between their stories and the one I grew up with are pretty startling. The first thing we notice is that the stories people told of themselves situated them within a cosmos that was itself alive. To them, the stars and the mountains and the streams were not mere matter moving about in some necessary pattern. These things were animated by the same spirit that animated them. The things in their world were not dead. A forest or a river or a valley was not an it or a that, but a thou. We call these myths now, implying that they are both fanciful and false. This is a conceit. 
But let's put a pin in that and examine the old stories some more. Another element they have in common is that not only is everything alive, but all life, as Ariel Sim just reminded us, is a circle. Not only does everything live, but everything dies. To every winter there comes a spring, every summer ends in autumn. The cycles of seasons and of weather, of growing and withering, of germinating and setting seed, of living and dying. These together form the complex rhythms of nature's endless dance. It is this dance in the old stories that gave context and meaning to human existence. Yet another common element was that all these living things are connected. The dancers are holding hands, dancing together. A change in one affects a change in all. And should the rains cease or come too fast and furiously, should the locusts increase or the game diminish, then nature's dance could become very different. The living world was generous. It could also be pitiless. It was necessary to respect, appease, and cooperate with nature. How different is this story from the story I was given, the story of unending technological progress, of a human exceptionalism that set us over and apart from nature, ready even to leave nature behind as a child leaves the cradle, as we rocket into our destiny among the stars? You can practically hear the soundtrack. Okay. I'd like to draw your attention to two things. First, in these very different stories, the ancient and the modern, what is the ask? Remember, it's what is asked that shapes belief. What in those old stories was wanted from the world and for human beings? We know that people prayed for clement weather and good harvests and for health and wealth. Wealth, I mean, not in the modern sense of riches, but in the original sense of well-being and prosperity. Industrial civilization's story of progress has an ask that is fundamentally different. Wellness in our story is tied to growth without limit, to rising standards of living, and to independence from nature and control over it. Given our proverb, lex orandi, lex credendi, lex credendi, lex vivendi, we would expect these two outlooks to compel very different approaches in how to live. The second thing I'd like to draw your attention to with respect to these two types of stories is their relationship to ordinary facts. Which story, the old or the new, is most rooted in what is real and rational? Now, this question requires some hard thinking because even asking it rubs right up against contemporary experience. No previous civilization put folks in outer space, eliminated smallpox or polio, built computers, or tied the human world into a single community with electronic communication. Surely our own civilization has a much better grasp on how things work. They believed in myths and we believe in science, for heaven's sake. And yet clearly something has gone very wrong. That's why we're here today. If you turn away from the clickbait of popular science headlines about flying cars and the latest renewable energy and examine instead the unvarnished scientific literature of the last half century or so, what emerges is an understanding of our relationship with the natural world that aligns poorly with our modern story, that in fact reveals our story to be its own kind of mythos. Our mythos is sometimes referred to as scientism because it rests on the assumption, one made plausible by our technological achievements, that there is no problem that scientific analysis and industrious invention cannot overcome. The mantra of our mythos is, nothing is impossible. Do you believe that? If you ever find yourself inclined to believe that nothing is impossible, I invite you to try to touch your elbow to your nose. Science does indeed give us fantastic advantages, but its greatest advantage turns out not to be in understanding why the ancients were wrong, but in understanding with vivid clarity why they were right. Without using the language of gods or spirits, science nonetheless affirms that the earth is a living thing, a biosphere as complex, as integrated, and as animated as any organism. It pulses with a bewildering array of interacting cycles 
the carbon cycle, the hydrologic cycle, the nutrient cycle, and the tectonic cycle, to name just a few of the most important ones. There are the oceanic circulations that bring warmth to the poles and cool waters and nutrients to the equator. There are climate cycles, ice ages, and interglacials. And there are the adaptive cycles of ecosystems, spawning fantastic menageries of interconnected species, not just across regions or continents, but across the ages of time, from dinosaurs to giant mammals to hominids like us. The earth is truly alive. Science also affirms nature's living dance, its rhythms, and its interdependence. It's that interdependence that is starting to smack us all upside the head. Science adds something not always emphasized in the old stories, that nature's dance is always changing. But those changes are rung on a time scale that includes the drift and clash of continents, the opening of seas and the raising of mountains. This is hard for us. The vastness of outer space is something we can kind of relate to. It's not hard to imagine something impossibly far away. But human beings don't have a way of conceptualizing the vastness of time in a way that is relatable to experience. A million years remains always an abstraction. This is the first of many mental handicaps we have when it comes to developing a full ecological awareness. For instance, we look at the geological record and see that our planet has been both much colder and usually much warmer throughout the history of life than it is now. We look next at predictions of climate change effects that will take decades or even centuries to be fully felt, and something inside us says, meh, nature can deal. But our time concepts are inadequate. Knowing we can safely decelerate from 100 kilometers per hour to zero in a few seconds, we wrongly conclude that we can safely decelerate from 100 to zero in a few millionths of a second. As the saying goes, it's not the fall that kills you. It's the sudden stop at the end. From the point of view of evolutionary time, the disruptions caused by industrial civilization are no less abrupt than the asteroid collision that wiped out the dinosaurs. Ecosystems can no more adapt to a rise of five degrees in average temperature in a single century than you or I could adapt to hitting the pavement at terminal velocity. This example illustrates something essential. As we draw together, as we are doing here to confront our common dilemma, we face the challenge of ecological consciousness, the challenge to identify and to overcome social and mental biases that prevent us from grasping our true relationship with nature, biases that lead many to imagine that we can live on the earth when in fact, we can only live as part of the earth. We need ecological consciousness because we need ecological wisdom. Now, we cannot go back to the old stories. We should know those stories as best we can, but we cannot return to ancient life ways because theirs was a wisdom that was lived, not written in textbooks or taught in PowerPoints or YouTube videos. It was lived communally and intergenerationally. It consisted of skills and habits, social expectations and mental frameworks that were learned from the cradle and which for many such reasons are not accessible to you and me but that's okay. We have a store of our own wisdom and we can access it. Our ask demands our first attention. What is it we want? Since you are here, I feel safe in guessing some of what you probably want. You want life. You ask to preserve a living world. You ask for a living world that preserves you. You ask for life that lives after you, preserving perhaps your own children in health and wealth and all the children to come. You ask for the world we have not to be destroyed. I invite young people to reflect on their own ask. It is, after all, how the direction of their journey is chosen. From there, we turn to our effort to understand our world and ourselves in it, to acquire ecological consciousness in the pursuit of ecological wisdom. Here, modern science can be very helpful because it has been through a few revolutions comparatively recently that have upended the old mechanical and exploitative views of nature upon which the industrial world was built. The science of ecology, and especially the discovery of ecological succession, have shown us how dynamic life systems are, 
and how integral they are to our own life as a species. The laws of thermodynamics permit us to understand with great clarity that we can never exist in independence from nature because everything we do affects it and it in turn determines our limits. Mathematical complexity and chaos, the laws of dynamical systems and the fundamental limits of formal reasoning have shown us that the abstract models we build of nature and its processes cannot even in principle capture in its entirety the profound dynamism and endless variation of nature. And so we can never script or manufacture for ourselves an artificial substitute for the living systems that created us and sustain us. To give you a taste, just a taste of these things, I'll present you with a few of the elements of ecological consciousness that I have learned from the work and wisdom of others. Many of these have to do with how special we aren't. It's commonplace for people, once they grok the scale of the emergency we've created, to conclude that since humans are obviously not angels, we must be devils. I constantly see statements like humanity is a cancer or our species is a virus and implying that the world can only heal if we are gone. Frankly, that's just egotism. We're a species in overshoot of our ecological environment. There's almost nothing more commonplace than that. Species go into overshoot all the time. And from the point of view of nature, it's not even a bug, but a feature. One of the ways that the adaptive cycle introduces creative disruptions. So far as I know, we're the first in at least several hundred million years to go into overshoot globally rather than regionally, which by the way, our species has done many times. And so perhaps we're the first to disrupt the entire biosphere in a very long time. But apart from that, our predicament is commonplace, boringly so. Similar conceits have to do with the grandeur of modern civilization. I don't mean about its being grand. It certainly is very grand. The conceits have to do with how we take credit for it. To begin with, we tend to think of modern civilization as something we designed. Let me ask you, do ants design an ant colony? The answer is no. No ant contains within its little brain the blueprint for an ant colony. Ant colonies are amazingly complex, but they come about not by following a plan, but as a result of the aggregate effects of thousands upon thousands of interactions among largely mindless ants, each of which is simply behaving according to its own simple nature. Scientists say that the colony is an emergent property of the ants themselves. They don't set about to do it exactly. They follow their instincts, their programmed behavior, and the complexity of their colony arises from thousands of them doing nothing more than that. In the same way, no human being holds in their head the plan of civilization. None could. The amount of information would be many orders of magnitude too big. Instead, our civilization arose out of the behaviors of billions of human beings and the trillions of daily interactions between them and between them and their environment. Civilization is an emergent property of human society. So we certainly made our civilization, but we didn't design it. And anyone thinking about ways we might redesign it might want to explore this feature of ecological science more deeply. A related conceit is that our civilization's complexity is a consequence of our cleverness. Now, I'm not here to deny human cleverness. It certainly exists in pockets here and there. But our individual faculties on the whole are not superior to those who lived in ages past. The complexity of our civilization is actually a direct and predictable result of our having stumbled on a half billion years or so of stored solar energy in the form of fossil fuels. The science is abstract and would take far too long to try to explore here, but the too long didn't read is that the laws of thermodynamics ensured that this discovery would lead directly to the explosion in size and complexity of our civilization. Those same laws ensure that the party is coming to an end because we'll soon run out of well, just about everything that an industrial civilization requires. And even if we didn't, we'd eventually just be overwhelmed by our own waste. Speaking of, and on the subject of energy, and this will make some people perhaps uncomfortable, the laws of thermodynamics place a profound limit on us that we should contemplate very deeply. 
All use of energy to perform work increases what is called entropy, which is an obscure way of saying it degrades the physical environment in which it is used. This is unavoidable and it is irreversible. Moreover, the extent to which it degrades the physical environment is directly proportional to the amount of energy being used. And this is true regardless of where the energy comes from. Most of the energy on earth that is available to do work comes from the sun. Plants harness that energy to do chemical work, to grow and make complex organic molecules like sugar and so on, much the way you might burn fuel to drive a power tool to make something useful or beautiful. But in both cases, the amount of energy being used results in a corresponding amount of entropy in the larger physical environment. This destructive aspect of nature is so slow as to be nearly imperceptible most of the time. But eventually, even without us contributing, the work that life does using the energy of the sun will degrade the substances of the earth to the point that complex life here will no longer be possible. Fortunately for us, that time is so very far away that from a human perspective, it might as well be the day after forever. Our problem is that we found half a billion years worth of sunlight and used it all up in a couple of centuries, which is to say all at once and the damage is all around us. Moreover, our present way of life is built on using that much energy. People searching for substitutes for fossil fuels with the expectation that we then won't have to find ways of life that dramatically use less energy overall haven't really thought it through yet. Here's a fun mental exercise. Imagine living as a modern person with technologies for communication, health, democratic governance, and so on, while using about as much energy each day as someone living not in 2021 or even in 1921, but in 1721. That is approximately the challenge we face as we look ahead to the end of this century. Lastly, I have to counsel humility. One of the dreams of science was to analyze everything, to break things down into their constituent parts and understand how they were put together and how they worked so that we could understand all of it. As a mathematician, I've had a front row seat to how that dream turned out. One of the most important discoveries of the 20th century was that the world, including nature, is irreducibly complex and in certain respects, fundamentally unknowable. We can understand a very great deal. We can indeed work wonders, but we can never know with complete certainty how the things we do today will affect the world tomorrow or even how it will affect ourselves. Human life has always been a challenge. In fact, it has usually been an existential challenge. Riding the crest of industrial civilization allowed us to forget that. Now we will have to remember it again because we face our biggest crisis probably since the last ice age. But, and I emphasize this to young people, we face it as human beings with our shoulders square and a glint in our eye and joy in our hearts. For to be a human being has always been, and still is, the greatest thing that could ever happen to you. Thank you. That's my remarks.